السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We begin in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful and we begin with sending all praise due to Allah all praise and most perfect praise to Allah, Lord of all the world Inshallah, alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ufiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina man yadihi allahu falamudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu falahadira wa ashadu wa la ilaha illa Allah wa ahduhu la sharika lahu wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all praise is due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from those of our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray and whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, the one who has no partner. And I bear witness that there is now that I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is Allah's servant and messenger. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves, and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. Ya you and Ladina Amr of Tahullah, Hulu Kolan Sadida, Yuslih Lakum, Aramalakum, Yalfil Lakum, Dunubakum, Mamayut Ilaha or Sulahu, Fakal the Faz of Fozan Albima, O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah, be mindful of Allah and say what is right. Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah, the Messenger of Allah, has truly achieved a great triumph. Rabbi Shirahli Sodri, Wasili Amri, Wahil Lukta the Milisani of the Holy. Again, this uh, Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu to everyone, uh, whether you're here in the space, inshallah, or whether you're seeing this in the future. Um, peace and blessings on you and Jummah Mubarak to you and your loved ones uh, on this blessed day of Jummah. So for me, as I was thinking about uh, this topic and thinking about what what uh, what we would maybe discuss today for the khutbah, this aspect, this question that I was asking myself uh, as I was you know, just driving on the road uh, yesterday was this notion of we're Muslim, or I'm Muslim, and now what? You know, the, the, we uh, many of us maybe uh, were born uh, as a Muslim or born into a Muslim family. Uh, many of us, you know, probably didn't have the agency to choose that. Uh, oh, I want to be like a Muslim. We, that choice wasn't probably really given to us uh, for most folks here. Uh, and in in a sense, you know, we 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 kind of uh, you know were given this this way of kind of being in life and this identity and just kind of ran with it there. And it was very interesting to me that uh, I'd noticed. So on Fridays, I usually go to uh, the local state prison here to facilitate Jummah services. So that doesn't mean that uh, I will always give the khutbah. I usually try to prioritize the other brothers who are uh, there, the incarcerated brothers, to be able to go and be able to give the khutbah. So sometimes I'm just there just in the sake of being able to help, help them have the khutbah space um, because of the different barriers that they face. And you know, we've maybe noticed this in people who we know in our lives, whether they've converted to Islam, whether they've kind of, uh, you know, rediscovered their faith in some way, shape or form, but there is this energy, there's this zeal, there's this, you know, just uh, really kind of tenacity in a sense of of, of really wanting to uh, see what this, not just what, uh, you know, what, what they can do with this faith, but the faith is very much an imperative for them to do something more, that that now I'm Muslim, I've got to do all these different things. And and for me, you know, when I, when I sit back and I see these brothers that have been in incarcerated, you know, that maybe some of them have been there for a few years, some of them, you know, almost 30 plus years, and many of them in terms of encountering Islam have, you know, maybe become Muslim in the last one, two, three years. But to see how they've really clung on to the faith, to see not only how they clung on to the faith, but it has become for them their means of emancipation, their means of freedom, in a sense that they they have an idea when they may be up for parole or when things might come around. But for them, in that sense, the, we, we talk about this concept of feeling free, feeling having this uh, the, this this agency that's been restored. So regardless of where they came from, what what had happened to them or where they what choices they may have made in life. But at this juncture, when they had accepted Islam to feel that the the religion had not only liberated them, but now it was a cause for them to do so much more. And, and, and it was really a it's a really a life giving source for them. And so it, it it makes folks like myself and maybe so many other folks as well maybe reflect how we might be taking our faith for granted. Um, you know, as I mentioned, most of the folks, whether here or um, most in the Muslim community and in, in the United States, can probably say that we were, you know, we 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 were born Muslim or we were born into a Muslim family. And again, that wasn't something that was probably uh, at the at the at the at the space our choice. But to see and to reflect from our brothers and sisters who converted to Islam out of a choice and thinking about what barriers did they have to go through, what bonds of kinship, what family ties did they uh, maybe, you know, end up uh, ended up falling apart because of that choice um, for the brothers in the prison. Um, I can I can just say from my work with them, being a Muslim does not make your experience any easier in prison. You don't get, uh, you know, any kind of pass or whatnot. Going to Jummah itself is uh, in and of itself a very uh, kind of 
big obstacle as compared to going to a, another kind of Christian worship or another prayer service or other activity. Um, it has its own hurdles. Uh, apart from that, you also have, uh, you know, the different materials and different access. You don't maybe have the same kind of access to your dietary preferences if you're uh, eating only halal meat or if you are trying to access certain learning materials. Uh, if you need a prayer rug, if you need a kufi, all these different things uh, are, are really hard to kind of do. So, you know, for, for someone in this space to not just, you know, discover Islam in a way that that they resonate with it, but to then, you know, go to that next step and to say, you know what, I want to uh, convert to this. I want to embrace this fully, despite being in, in an environment that does not make it conducive or is not uh, maybe helped by it, maybe gives us a space of thinking about what benefit does this religion provide? What, what 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 substantive benefit does this religion offer? For those of us from different places or points of privilege who have grown up with the religion or grow, grew up in a Muslim household, uh, we may, as I mentioned, may have taken some of these things for granted. We may not even consider uh, some of these things in a sense of uh, what our faith may benefit us. Uh, we may actually see our faith as actually being a burden because of the privileges we enjoy. Uh, our faith is seen as limiting us in, in what we're able to do in terms of, uh, oh, we can do certain things, and uh, but our, our, our religion is the thing, that the ball and chain that's holding us down. And and for me, when I was when I was just kind of sitting with these brothers, I was seeing that it's really the flip side up here. They have they they literally have nothing in in some of these cases. Some of them have uh, you know don't have any family you know that they go back to. So they've they've uh, in terms of just you see when uh, when when inmates you know people become. Uh, when, when they are released from prison as well, just the amount of barriers that they have. Those records are always going, th those felonies and uh, different things are going to be on their records. So the different barriers to get a job, to just become a functioning member of society as it deems uh, is, is, is so, you know, just obfuscated with respect to all these uh, these different barriers. But then to add on to that, uh, to become a Muslim uh, doesn't, you know, maybe do you any favors in, 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 the, in, the, in the normative system. And so in looking at these uh, these individuals, whether or not you know folks who are in the carceral system or incarcerated and accept Islam, uh, or for brothers and sisters who convert to Islam, they come to uh, the faith out of their own agency and and you know after having you know lived a full life and yeah, make a conscious decision that I'm going to become a Muslim. Uh, there's probably so much that we can learn because they're coming from a space that maybe does not have those same privileges that is afforded to them as opposed to folks like myself who may have grown up in a Muslim house, who've grown up uh, with the Quran kind of being taught at a young age, grown up with a lot of the salah being taught when you're a kid. And so it's really easy to take uh, take into account. But to kind of see what is this what is this faith doing? What does it call for us to do? What what is what does it lead us uh, to, to, to do in the sense of not just a uh, outward obligation to the world around us, but also the obligation that we have to ourselves. Um, I remember my first day I went to, the very first day I started to do some work with the uh, the Muslim prisoners there. I walk into the Juma room or to the multi-purpose hall that's there, and I see a brother praying his sunnah prayer. And I walk in, and this brother is has a white sheet of paper, just a simple notebook you know, uh, paper that's there. And he has the entire salat transliterated on that piece of paper and it's on the ground and he's standing there reading his salat reading that paper there the and this this brother just converted to islam that the year before a few months before and you know had come from a, a very different background and was kind of standing in the space where he's reading you know the salah he's trying to absor uh, absorb this language this 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 ritual this prayer space in a language that was completely different from his own but because he was connected to it, he, he he felt the power in that and he was going that extra mile to not just say like okay hey like this religion is has a lot of different um you know just like obstacles it's just it's a different language and different ways i don't know how i'm going to connect with this but goes that extra mile to write that transliterated and last week that was that was the brother who was given khutbah at uh, the juma service that he was uh, talking about how uh, the quran can be a source of healing and, and this was that brother that on the first juma i ever went over there was someone who's uh, who's had his uh his salah written down on a piece of paper in front of him and trying to read it um and and thinking about in that sense, for many of us who grew up with Islam or, or in Islam in our homes, you know, learning the Salah, learning maybe basic uh, reading of the Arabic and of the Quran, all these different things may have been routine, just even learning the Salah itself, you know, it's, it's maybe just uh, phonetic in a sense, and then we just, it, it's, it's auditory, so we, we listen and, you know, we just, we just say sometimes without thinking, but for folks who willingly, especially at an adult age or of their own choice, come to Islam and uh, make that cognizant decision to say, I want to become a Muslim and work through those things which we may have just learned as kids or we may have just kind of taken in, it gives us such a fuller dimension and fuller appreciation that we may no longer see for these things. It may be like, you know, what, what's the point of me doing the Salah? What's the, I'm busy. I'm doing all this. What's the point of me, you know, just going and reading the Quran? What's, what's the point of any of these things? And to see where we've kind of maybe come in a space of complacency, uh, to look at our brothers and 
brothers and sisters who've uh, make, made that step, made the sacrifice and made that choice to come to Islam of their own accord, of no pressure, not being born into it or anything like that, uh, to see what beauty our religion truly offers. Because it is in these people, it's in this experience that our religion came about. Our religion did not come about in a way that uh, it was it was all just given to uh, infants or children, and then they just grew up as a new generation of Muslims. It came to a society that was uh, dynamic, that was full of adults ranging, uh, you know, from 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds. It had children as well, but Islam was a choice. Islam was something that they were not born with inherently. The Prophet Sallallahu at age 40 conveyed this message to people, uh, and they, 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 they had to make a choice. And those choices resulted in uh, things that did not make their life any easier. You know, they ended up becoming expelled from their land. Their families broke ties with them. Some of them were killed. Some of them were imprisoned. Uh, some of them lost all their wealth. Uh, some of them, you know, lost every and anything that maybe had gotten them to a certain stage. Some of them who didn't have anything uh, were even further kind of marginalized and, and put in the periphery. So thinking about how Islam came as something to these people in a space that was not advantageous. It, it didn't provide, it, as soon as someone accepted Islam, it did not make them you know, the chief of their tribe. It did not provide any practical advantages. It may have probably been seen in the sense of like a ball and chain for some folks, that if I uh, embrace Islam, I'm gonna lose all of this stuff. Yet people still took the dive. People still took the dive, and for those, uh, for the uh, brothers and sisters that convert to the faith, that revert to the faith, um, or for the uh, prisoners that that we've talked about and that, that worship um, and you know have have come to Islam uh, and come to worship on Jum'ah, thinking about what what about the faith is it there that what 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 about uh, what what about this religion is it that uh, not only that brings them to the space, but what does it call us to do? You know, and I think when we when we look at the stories of some of these folks, when we look at the stories of why our um, our predecessors, our ancestors, those who we call our pious predecessors, why they converted at the and 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 for to think about how we maybe see Islam when we struggle with Islam uh, from a privileged standpoint of seeing how we can do certain things or not do certain things, we we gain that appreciation, but it makes us maybe think about some things. It makes us maybe think about well, now that we're Muslim, now that we've kind of embraced this idea, now what do we do? Uh, because we see from these folks that, that have embraced it, that it's caused them to transform their lives. It's caused them to rethink maybe how they deal with people. And in a parallel sense, we see this with the Sahaba. We see this with the Prophet Sallallahu We see this with the earliest Muslims, that when they embraced Islam, what did that mean for them? Islam for them was not just the uh, Ahadun Ahad. It was not just about the one God. It was not just that. It was also about changing how they dealt with each other, changing their sense of neighborliness, changing their hospitality, changing how they uh, viewed social structures, all these different things. Islam was a 23-year enterprise, and it was. And if it needed to just be theological, it would be a very quick uh, in and out. But the fact that the Quran and the revelation came over this whole period gives us a little bit of insight to what our religion maybe uh, means to us beyond what we may have been taught it to be, or what we may assume it to be. A lot of us think about Islam, we may come up with things like, oh, you know, five pillars, here's uh, the holy book, you know, I can put Islam into the binds of a book, and this is what the religion is. And we really do a disservice to the transformative power of uh, Islam. So when we say that we come to Islam, you know, all of us here, here and there, you know, as however we identify as Muslim, we, we also need to kind of recognize what that, what, what that brings about with it. Thinking about, in a sense, if you have uh, any professional, in a sense, let's say you have a doctor, a doctor puts on a white coat, you have um, a first responder, they put on a uniform, uh, you have any of these individuals that that, that have this kind of uh, this kind of degree, and they they have uh, something outwardly that shows that they have that uniform. You, you often hear the saying that um, you know when you're uh, when you put on that badge, when you put on that coat or whatnot, you know you have certain responsibilities that are there. There are certain expectations that come from you. And so thinking about, in a sense, that when we put on that coat uh, of being a Muslim, when we wear that identity of however we may be in our spiritual journey, irrespective of that, whether we feel like, you know, I'm kind of connected to Islam here and there, whether I feel like I'm gung-ho about the faith, whatever you are in that sense, wherever you are, you, you, you put on that identity of a Muslim, but think about what now, you know, what, 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 what does this, what does this mean for me now? What does this mean for other people? Thinking about what are the responsibilities of a Muslim? And the reason I was lifting up the uh, narratives and some of the examples of our um, brothers and sisters who have accepted Islam of their own choice and of their own autonomy Gives, uh, can give us an insight in terms of what our responsibility might be, because in a sense of what they feel, why they felt compelled to convert, um, especially if it was not an advantageous situation, uh, and, and thinking about that aspect of transformation. So when I was talking about some of the brothers that converted, these were brothers that, you know, for 
whether for systemic and societal reasons or, or just in a sense of uh, being in, in, in a company that was not conducive, you know, got into some uh, bad situations and maybe made some uh, not so wise choices, but also were probably just at the wrong place at the wrong time. But thinking about how for them, Islam was breaking the cycle. Many of them have been in and out of prison, in and out of prison. Uh, and for them, Islam was kind of, it has been kind of the break in that cycle that says that that behavior that I'm engaging in, those substances I'm engaging with, the people that I engage in, it's giving me a moment to pause. It's giving me a moment to stop and to reset my life and to, to be able to say, what am I, what is my true purpose? How do I really conduct myself? How should I conduct myself? And, and, and make them above all mindful. Uh, and, and because we are in a world, we are in a society where you can kind of, you just follow your own whims. You kind of just ping pong around and just go through different things. But the accountability sometimes is not uh, so much emphasized. It's just, you know, go have fun, go have a great time, um, you know, live your life, you know, YOLO, do what you need. But uh, there's, there's not that system of, of grounding. And uh, when, we, when we have a system of grounding, uh, when we are in the space of privilege, we look at that system of grounding as maybe limiting that, well, it's not allowing us to do this. It's not allowing me to experience life to the fullest or whatever it might be. And to think about what, how, how our concept of that is, is, is a bit warped in a sense. What do we mean by living our fullest life? Is it by doing those things or participating in those things or saying those things or drinking those things or whatever it may be that uh, may feel good, may feel fun, may be uh, something that, that gives us a, a bit of a high? Um, or is it something that actually is, is chipping away? It's something that's harming us. It's something that's hurting us. And so thinking about for us in the sense that now that we have this coat of being a Muslim on, what, what is our responsibility? When the doctor puts on that white coat, what is the responsibility of that doctor? They take an oath you know, that says to, to do no harm. Um, when the first responder puts on their badge or puts on their uniform, what is their uh, responsibility? So for us, what is that responsibility? What does it mean now? You know, where, Wherever we might be as Muslims, uh, whether we've converted to the faith or whether we are those who have uh, accepted it um, in, 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 in later in life or those of us who are born into it, what does this mean for us now? And we think about how the uh, how, how in, in the Quran, Allah tells us that you, speaking to the Muslims, speaking to those who accepted the message of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that you are the best people created for the good of humanity. You're the best people created or ever raised up for the service of humanity, the benefit of humanity. You enjoin what's right, you forbid what's wrong. And sometimes our notions of that can kind of get black and white. I was at, a, I was at Trinity University yesterday where I uh, served uh, doing some chaplaincy work with the Muslim students that were there. And we, we, we asked, I, I, we posed this question. I said, what's right? What, what does this mean to you in your specific life? And a student had brought up a really interesting point uh, that, that shows the nuance that when I say, when I say, enjoin what's right, forbid what's wrong, sometimes we may just think about where our parents said, what's good, what's bad, or what, what, would, uh, what was wrong would get us kind of maybe uh, a spanking, what was good uh, would get us, uh, you know, a reward or sense. It's very green light, red light, black and white type of situation that we have here. And she brought up the, the, an interesting example that uh, for me, what forbidding the wrong looks like is that I may be in an institution or in a place that doesn't offer some safety or doesn't offer safe places for those who are on the margins. And so for me, uh, forbidding the wrong looks like, uh, you know, one, to, to speak out against that, to, to try to create safe spaces, and in joining in the right is, uh, is, is kind of building on that as well. So the forbidding of the wrong doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, a, a completely polarized thing. The forbidding of the wrong can be, uh, as she had mentioned, you know, in, this, in the safe space, going to those folks who are not offered a safe space, checking in with them, seeing how they are doing, rather than just going and feeling that we need to raise a fist up or we need to do something else up. Uh, forbidding the wrong can also be a space where we are still uh, caring for people, where we are not just shaming people. We're not just, you know, going gung-ho and, and, and trying to up, up, uplift something or just to destroy something, you know, completely. But to first and foremost, uh, those folks who are impacted by the harm, who are impacted by the wrong, to be there for that person and then to enjoin in the good by creating a space that is conducive for them. And so to see the nuance in that, it, it it makes us think about what our responsibility is. As Prophet Sallallahu had taught us that uh, Muslim is one who, uh, from their hand, from their tongue, other people are safe, uh, that they, they don't have to feel harmed by them. And the Prophet Sallallahu lifted up a maxim of do no harm nor reciprocate harm. So don't harm anybody, don't commit harm in the world, and do not reciprocate harm. So thinking about how we can conduct ourselves now that we are Muslim, just you know that whatever that might mean for us, whether it just means that like I said, I'm born into it. I, it's just something I am. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm with it. Or if I'm just like, you know what? I am like full on board Muslim, five times a day praying, doing all this stuff. I love uh, my faith, all that, whatever it may be, whoever you are at that stage. But now what does the next step mean? And I think that responsibility for us, uh, it's a very personal question. We ask ourselves, uh, what does that mean for us? Because a Muslim is one who has responsibility, not just to the world around them, 
but also has a responsibility to themselves, has a responsibility to the inward, to your inner soul, to your inner, uh, to your inner being. But you also have that responsibility in tandem with the world around you, everything external. You have a responsibility to God. You have these external responsibilities, but you have an internal responsibility. So when you when we reflect on our Islam, and when we think about what does Islam mean to us, we 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 look into those spaces where Islam came. Where Islam was a difficulty, where Islam was uh, was chosen in a sense by individuals who were not in advantageous situations, uh, chosen by people which made their lives difficult, but they chose it and found some something else from it, found something beyond what the world had had defined as uh, beneficial or as uh, a status per se. We think about the example in Mecca. The, the, the religion of Islam came to people who were already maybe in a certain structure. Some of them were very disadvantaged. Some of them were pretty privileged. And thinking about the religion didn't offer them anything of any worldly particular benefit, but it offered them a liberation. It offered them a liberation from the type of classism that they had constructed. It offered them a liberation in terms of the dehumanization that they had normalized. It offered them a liberation in terms of some of the, uh, the economic systems that they had put in that benefited some people over another. It offered them a liberation from uh, being chained to just the cycle of harm and the cycle of exploitation and so much more. It offered them a liberation in a sense of thinking about, uh, about God um, and, and to recenter their notion of God, that God was not just something disposable or something that uh, was, was transactional but that God was uh, watchful. God was there present all the time uh, and a source of strength and a source of connection. God was not just a commodity to be sold to the highest bidder. So thinking about how the religion came in a space that it was not conducive, it was not going to make the most money, it was not going to uh, make life easier for folks, but it offered a liberation from those things which were inherently harmful uh, and inherently uh, you, know, di- uh, you know, kind of uh, diverting society in a way where some people were becoming very privileged and some people were becoming very uh, you know, marginalized, but at the same time, harm was being done across the board. The people who were on the margins were experiencing a harm that was unimaginable in terms of persecution, exploitation, and the people at the top were also experiencing a harm as a product of society by being insulated to their, their power and to be insulated to this influence and staying, staying high on that. And thinking about how Islam came to, to change that a little bit. And so when we think about for us, in a sense of Islam, what does it mean to us here? First and foremost, recognizing how we may, and these, like I said, these are personal reflections, but thinking about how do we sit with this, uh, this religion? How do we think about this religion at the current present? Do we feel that Islam is something that feels like an anchor to us, that feels like maybe a, a ball and chain that's holding us back? And if so, what, what, what is causing us to think that? Don't, to, to remove this aspect of judgment or shame, you know, don't feel bad for thinking that uh, I feel that my religion is, is kind of like holding me down because I want to participate in the things in society. There's no shame in that. You know, you, you, we are products of our environment, but we want to ask, we want to challenge the thinking behind that. What is the system that brought that to, to light? What is the um, frame of mind? What are all the different things that are, uh, that are underlying that question or that thought? Uh, and so thinking about how do we see our faith, why we might see it as a uh, as something that is dragging us versus why we might see it as something that is liberative and something that is opening or something that is transformative. And in space, in either or, whether we are in that space where we feel our faith is something that will help us uh, to continue to improve, or if it's something that is just holding us back in life, to be able to then look at uh, these stories, not just of our uh, pious predecessors from the time of Prophet Sassam, but the very real stories of our brothers and sisters who have come to the faith of their own volition and of their own agency, who are in our midst, who are there on the margins who we sometimes ignore, not sometimes, very often ignore in our mosques, who we ignore uh, for our iftar invites and our Ramadan invites, who we do uh, an absolute disservice to because we feel that they need to get to a certain level uh, of Islam before we can say that you're officially Muslim or that uh, they need to pray uh, you know, fully in a certain way. They need to do all these things, receive all these benchmarks before they can get to where we're at. Um, and rethinking that that maybe we need to kind of get to where they're at because they they first and foremost came to the faith when it was not advantageous to them. Live. And that is the most you know kind of a uh, pre early Islamic kind of way of coming to the faith in a sense when it when it doesn't benefit you practically from what the world says uh, and, it, and it offers that space. So for us to then say, what do we, um, what, what can we learn? And so if we take away something from this in conclusion is that valuing the stories of our brothers and sisters who uh, and, and of our pious predecessors who chose to come to Islam, but not just that, asking what benefit did it serve them, not just in the practical sense, but uh, or in the worldly sense, but what, what really did it offer them? Uh, and we won't know these stories, uh, especially the contemporary ones, unless we want to go and we do the work of engaging with our brothers and sisters and talking to them, say, what about Islam? What, 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 what was it? Tell me your story, because I guarantee you there's so much more that we can learn from their experience and their connection to why they came to the faith, uh, that we can learn about our faith and the transformative power of our faith than we probably can spending a lifetime just surrounded by people who are just born Muslim. Uh, that their one perspective in that space can offer us so much uh, of an insight of the power this religion has, the power this faith has 
uh, in, in, in adversity, in transforming someone, and in carrying out uh, their responsibilities or who they see their renewed purpose as in the world around them. So inshallah, as we said, we started with the question of Muslim, now what? And I end that in a sense of asking you all to be able to reflect on wherever you define yourself as, however you identify. You came to this khutbah, uh, you go into different spaces, you put on that, uh, that jacket of Muslim, whatever that means to you. But what is the responsibility that you feel that you now have? Uh, what is the responsibility that you feel your religion brings about to you? Because it, great power brings great responsibility, and the, a great faith brings its own responsibility. And our Prophet, as we mentioned, taught us don't harm and don't reciprocate harm. And our Quran, our, uh, our God, teaches us that uh, you know we are a nation that's raised for service, for the good and benefit. We're a nation that helps. Uh, we're not a nation that harms, uh, but we are a nation that enjoins that which is right, and we forbid that which is wrong. But how can we look at this from a holistic standpoint where our religion can be a means of helping society, helping the people around us, helping ourselves in a way that minimizes harm, that reduces harm, but that uh, that increases the benefit that we offer, even if it doesn't look like our traditional normative ways of uh, forbidding wrong in a, in a very negative sense or uh, enjoying what's right in a very positive sense, but to see how our religion can be a very uh, liberating thing for both ourselves and for the world around us. So inshallah, we ask Allah to grant us the knowledge, to grant us the patience to grant us the forbearance to be able to uh to, to be able to sit with this this faith to be able to sit with our brothers and sisters who've come to this faith of their own choice to be able to recognize the point of privilege to be able to recognize the fact that maybe we, we, we had been um you know ungrateful for a lot of the things maybe we've taken for granted uh what our faith has to offer to allow us a space to just reset uh, and to think about what islam has to offer um, not just us but the world around us inshallah we uh, ask allah to guide us and guide us all to the right path the path of those who allah has bestowed favor upon and not those who have incurred the displeasure of allah and we ask allah to uh to allow us to leave this juma inshallah uh, better than we had come into it and to allow us to enter the next juma better than we had left this one um, and to make from the mistakes the sins and uh the the, the, the trips that we make, the falls that we experience in life, uh, the opportunities for repentance and of growth, purification, excellence. And we ask Allah about all things to not let us take our Islam for granted, that wherever we may be to allow us to be helped in a way that we can see not just our Islam as an identity, as something that we can put on an application, as something that we can put in a story, or as something that's just a superficial marker, but as truly a seed that can produce a blooming garden and blooming orchard of uh, change, not just within our own selves, but within the world around us. Allahumma salli ala محمد وعلى آل محمد كما سليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد بعد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يعمر بالأدل والإسلام ويتعد الخطبة وينحى عن الفشاء والمنكر والبغي يعينكم لعلكم تذكرون وتقول الله يذكركم وتقول يستجيب لكم ولا ذكر الله يذكر وسبحان الله ما الله be merciful to you verily Allah commands you to act with justice to confer benefits upon one another and to do good to others as one does good to one's own family and forbids evil which you which pertains to yourself and evil which affects other people and prohibits unlawful rebellion in lawful situations he warns you against being unmindful of Allah. Allah warns you against being unmindful. Remember Allah. Allah will also remember you. And call upon Allah. He'll make a response for you. And verily, in divine remembrance is the highest virtue. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Again, Jumu Mubarak to you all uh, and to you and your families, inshallah.